All right, so we are going to get started. Um, good morning, everyone on the line. My name is David Olson from Macro View Investment Management. We have the privilege of being the consultant on your company's 401k plan. And as part of that, each month, um, some of you may be familiar if you've attended uh, past webinars, each month we uh, talk about a topic. It could be um, applicable to you or your family's situation and just tr try to provide a little bit of education around that topic, whether it be uh, 529 college planning or something involving taxes uh, in the springtime, uh, given that that's a big topic. And sort of on the back of last month's presentation, which was all about end of year planning and certain things that, that you can get done uh, prior to December 31st to sort of uh, set yourself up uh, in a better position financially going into the new year. Um, we're going to sort of uh, ride those coattails, and today we'll be talking about estate and family planning. Um, this is a topic that should apply to all of us in one form or another, um, so hopefully uh, you take a good bit of information uh, from today's conversation and, um, uh, and can think about how it might apply to your situation. And before I get started, as always, need to remind you that uh, today's presentation is uh, strictly educational uh, in its purposes, and none of this should be interpreted as specific advice to your uh, unique situation. And if uh, you do walk away with um, uh, sort of questions or ideas from today's conversation, you know, highly encourage you to talk to your financial, tax, legal professionals in your life and, and see uh, what steps might need to be taken. A um, couple housekeeping items. Please, in, in the chat box, if you have any questions throughout the course of the conversation, please feel free to put them in there. If you're having any technical difficulties, uh, please let me know in there as well and we'll try to get those sorted out. And then in the handout section of uh, your drop-down menu, um, you'll be able to grab a copy of the presentation that you should be seeing on the screen right now and a little um, uh, one-pager uh, on the discussion of wills uh, that'll make more sense uh, as we get along in, in today's discussion. So uh, with all of that out of the way, um, would love to, to hop in to today's discussion and um, sort of set the table. So Really, uh, you, you might have heard or even uh, worked on some topics uh, around the, the topic of estate and family planning and, and what that might mean for you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. That'll be sort of the framework of that, the discussion and sort of the basics surrounding that. And then we're going to hop into the reasons why we need to think about family planning. Uh, what is the topic of, of family planning mean in terms of who should you think be thinking about in your life? Um, how do we get started if you have not started already? And then some of the basics of what goes into an estate plan or a family plan or a legacy plan, you know, all of those terms are sort of interchangeable uh, in, in, their, in their meaning. And how do we go about getting started in creating that plan? And today we're actually very fortunate to have a guest joining us. Uh, Paulette Lundy is the principal and founder of the Lundy Law Group. They are based out of Columbia, Maryland, and they are experts in estate planning and family law. So Paulette, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to, to learning from you today. Good morning, Dave. Thank you so much for having, having me today. Absolutely. So, so Paulette, we're going to jump right in and sort of let you take the stage. And, and really, the, the first thing that we want to cover is really the, the basics of estate and family planning and what that should mean to, to all of us and, and what, sh what are some of the things that, that we should be thinking about. Sure, sure. Thank you, Dave. So a few minutes ago, you guys should have heard an alarm ring. That was my alarm and it was unintentional, but I realized how ironic it is that um, it happened because we should be sounding the alarm in our lives and our families' lives about estate and family planning. It is urgent and it really, if you want to sum it up, 
Dave, it's the gift. You know, when we say that we love our family, when we say we love our community, then it's really the gift, especially in this season, the gift that keeps on giving. It's the gift that we express to our family and our loved ones that we love them, even though we're not here to interact with them the same way that we normally do. We love them enough that we left behind plans for them. So when we ask, what is estate and family planning? It's, it's really a process of ensuring that you have the right documents in place. But it's, it's a new thing that we have to, we have to look at it in a new way. I think we used to look at estate planning as this, this thing that only the rich and famous do, the people who have the mega estates and the people who have you know billions in assets, whether it's liquid or, or property. But it's really relevant to everyone. And you said it earlier that it, it should apply to all of us. It does apply to all of us. It applies to us now as we are alive because it helps you to manage your affairs and your assets while you're alive. It also applies to us in our, um, in our death. And so it helps to authorize others to assist us if we um, become disabled and pass, or if we just pass um, without any, any warning. You know, we, we saw what happened um, in 2020. People were around and then they disappeared and there were no plans and families were left in a bind. So the core of estate and family planning is putting your affairs in order, getting your house and your business in order so that in your incapacity or your death, that there are um, proper instructions on what to do with your assets and what to do with you. If, if you become sick, how can someone help you and who can help you? So that's what the core of a state and family planning is about. So why do we need it? Um, it is to help us express our wishes. How many times have you heard someone say, oh, I know, I know what my mom wants, or I know what my dad wants. Eh, you may know that, but is it in writing? So when the rubber hits the road that you know exactly what they want in, in the most minute manner. And so it helps to express your wishes so your family knows what you want, what you desire. It helps to protect you and your family, especially what I call the vulnerable populations, Dave. Those are your children and your um, individuals with special needs. I have two kids and my husband and I love to travel and I just would basically really throw them at my mom and my sisters and we were on the plane and years ago I realized I said to my husband God forbid anything happened to us we left no information no instructions behind and that's when I got serious about estate planning and I really started sounding the alarm and spreading the news that people who are vulnerable our children and our people with special needs they need to be protected my mom is at home right now as we speak who died when my dad passed in 2018, she just she just took a nosedive. My mother now has dementia, full blown, doesn't speak or doesn't walk. So thank God we had plans for her because now she is in a vulnerable state and we need to take care of her. So I know many of us on the call have family members, whether it's children, parents, um, we're in the sandwich generation and we need to make sure that those in a vulnerable state are protected. So it helps you to protect you and your family members. It helps protect your assets. You know, I know many people would say, I really don't have a lot. You have something and that something has to be accounted for. That's something, whether it's a business, an asset, um, your insurance plan, whatever it is, someone has to be able to access it and to do with it what you've expressed that you want it done. So business-wise, they'll have to wind up the business. They'll have to pass it on to someone. If there's a partnership, there needs to be um, things to, that has to be done formally by someone who has authority. It also allows you to pass down family traditions and heirlooms. How many of us have something that our great grandmother gave to our grandmother who gave to our mother who gave to us and now we may wanna pass it on. It could be a recipe. It doesn't actually have to be something tangible. It could be a recipe um, that will help your cooking life for years to come. You know, those family um, events, you always wanna have something special that ties you back to you know, your, your, your grandmother or your great grandmother. So it can accomplish many things, but most of all, it has to be memorialized. It has to be in writing. It has to give someone authority. And so this is why we need an estate plan, um, a family plan, and we need it for our family. 
We need it for ourselves and we need it for our assets and business. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Paulette. And you know, you you said a couple things there that that really rang true for me. And that's that's the idea that that so many of us sort of uh, go through life or or maybe came up in a situation where uh, we get to adulthood and our our parents are still around and and for whatever reason there's this justification made that maybe estate planning isn't for us or it's not meant for us and you know I I think the the if you really just zoom out on it and and the message there is if for no other reason to think about estate planning when the time comes where you lose a loved one, whether it's a parent or a spouse, having an estate plan in place helps from having a bad, painful situation get even worse. Huh. And I think that all of us on the line have maybe had to confront that situation already in life. And you know, if, if for no other reason, you want to address it from that perspective. Absolutely, Dave. And I can tell you that we get phone calls every day with individuals telling us that a loved one has passed away and there are no plans. Today marks the uh, third year of my dad's passing. He passed on December 14, 2018. Prior to passing, my father called the family together and he said, take care of the family. He was talking to my husband, despite having uh, other male children. <laughs> he gave my husband, because he lived with us, so he gave my husband the charge to take care of the family. And he said, this is what I've put in place. So take care of the family. And that's our charge. Take care of the family. But there are so many people that come up with so many excuses, we have to call them, um, or reasons why they don't do it. And it really is just an, I tell people, an epic fail. So I'll do it later is an epic fail. Later is not promise. I don't want to think about it is an epic fail. If you don't think about it, something somebody else will think about it. And it just may not be done according to what you would have wanted. My family will know what to do is an epic fail. When we are mourning the death of a loved one, we don't know what to do. Our reasoning and rationalizations are not, they shouldn't be trusted. Feel confident that you've done enough epic fail. You always have to remind yourself and refresh and review to ensure that you've done all that you need to do. And it really shouldn't just be your decision, if you will. And what I mean by that is if you are not an expert or you don't have the requisite knowledge to know that you've done everything from an estate planning perspective, check with, with an attorney. It doesn't have to be me. It just has to be someone who specializes in estate planning. Letting it feel too overwhelming or being overwhelmed by it, it's an epic fail. I tell people, let us do the heavy lifting. Answer my questions and we will make sure that you're in good standing. Don't let it overwhelm you because if it's overwhelming you and it's your affairs, imagine how it's going to overwhelm others. I don't have enough assets or it doesn't apply to me, epic fail. It applies to you because it's your assets, it's your life, and whatever you have requires someone to handle for you. I tried to call and pay a phone, a cable bill for my mom. It was a cable bill. And they would not let me do it because she had to authorize it. And I said, well, I'm her daughter. And, and I wanted to say, I pay all the bills. <laughs> you know, let me just give you this money. And um, they said, no, she had to approve it. She wasn't around at the time. So we ended up having to hang up the phone. And, um, and this was many, many years ago. And so simple things with cutting off utilities. You can't do it unless you have authority. Uh, thinking that it's too expensive or trying to do it online. Epic fail. It, it may be expensive, but I tell people you pay now or you pay more later. So doing it now while you have the time and you have um, you put forth the strategy and you actually plan for it both for time wise and finances, it will it will um, achieve your, your like my um, husband would say, you know, your dollars will make better sense because when you do it later, you'll be paying more. Your family will be paying more, both in time as well as um, potential conflict, as well as money. So don't let, ex you know, the thought that it's too expensive be the thing that holds you back. The last one, afraid to think, think about death, 
epic fail. It's going to happen. I have not yet seen anyone that lived forever. And so if you don't do it now, because you think that if you just talk about it, it might happen, th that is an epic fail. It can happen at any time. And so why not be prepared in the event that it happens and so that we're not leaving behind families in a mess? So there is no excuse, Dave, that can be given <laughs> that will justify why we do not do a comprehensive and an effective estate plan um, regarding our assets, our life, and our family members. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And even with all that, that those powerful reasons uh, to give us the motivation to do it, uh, the data says otherwise, and that uh, many people, uh, and even more and more people, are are failing to get this this job done. And it is it is amazing that the trend is going downward as opposed to upward. And you know, we hear I don't know if you've heard a lot about the silver tsunami, which is um, a talk about the um, we're looking at the greatest population of seniors and elders who will be transitioning. Um, their assets to their loved ones. And so that means there's work to be done. And so we should have a plan so that it's not thrusted into, you know, the probate process that will subject it to a number of um, events and, and finances and time and conflict that could be avoided. So yeah, this trend is alarming. Yep. Yep. So Paulette, with, you know, we've, we've, we've given plenty of reasons as to why estate planning is a necessity. Let's get into some of the, I guess, the finer aspects of it. So if someone listening has convinced themselves that I need to do this or I need to take a couple more steps, what are some of those things that they should be thinking about to building out a more robust estate plan? Sure, Dave. I tell people um, a comprehensive and an effective estate plan has several components to it. And if you have nothing at all, I tell people absolutely at least have um, a few documents and, and one would be considered a last will and testament. And that's, you know, what we know, you know, we've seen it on, on uh, television a, a million times where someone is in their deathbed and they're signing off something on a tissue or a piece of paper. A real last will and testament is one where you methodically and strategically um, plan out who you would like to handle your affairs. Who will your personal representative be? Um, what are the assets that you have that you're leaving behind and to whom? Um, it, and, and it triggers or it's triggered upon your death. And so if you have nothing at all, you should at least have a last will and testament because it will handle your affairs after your death. However, there are more facets that will be more effective. And as we go down the line, um, we can talk about a trust. A trust is just like a will. It's a legal document. Um, if you go back one, I'll, I'll get into the details first, but it's, it's a legal document like a will, but it has, it has better provisions. And then there's a power of attorney. It can be a financial POA or a medical POA. Um, then you should have an advanced healthcare directive with a HIPAA waiver that will, um, handle your affairs, what we call pretty much on your deathbed. Um, and guardianship nominations, that is something that will help if you have children or vulnerable individuals who need the um, authorization or the oversight. So jumping into a trust, what is a trust? As I mentioned, it is a legal document, just like a will, but a trust has different laws that allows it to assist a person right now. So if you signed off on your trust today, you actually have established instructions that could help you if you were to become incapacitated. It will immediately have individuals who have been identified and authorized to jump in and handle your affairs on your behalf. So it documents your plan of care for yourself if you become incapacitated, for your family, if you have family members that you take care of who have special needs. We have a growing population of individuals who have special needs, individuals who have some measure of um, um, deficiency or um, a better word is a disability or you know whether it's mental or physical they may not be able to handle their affairs themselves and they need the help and so it will establish a plan of care for 
for them. And, it, you know, there could be something called a special needs trust that is established for um, our loved ones. And then it helps to establish a plan of care for your assets. Who do you want to either manage the exchange and the transfer of your assets to your loved ones? Who do you want to receive your assets? So it addresses lifetime as well as your death. But the biggest thing, Dave, is that it avoids probate court. And um, what we, we've heard for many years is get a will, get a will, get a will. Well, that's great because as I mentioned before, if you have nothing else, have a will. However, whether you have a will or not, hear me, whether you have a will or not, it will be processed the same way, meaning it has to go through probate court. They have to submit a petition. They have to wait at least six months before they can act on the assets because it is giving, I call it an, invita an invitation for claims against the estate. It is alerting people through the newspaper posting that there is an estate that has been um, established for XYZ person. And if you have a claim against the estate, you have six months, six months to file it. So your family is in limbo for six months because distributions cannot happen until after the claims period has closed. So that in and of itself is a discouragement in my opinion to just have a will. And so you want to avoid that if you can, because it's very time consuming um, with the fact that you can file a claim against the estate. It can cause um, family claims to come through, um, other claims to come through. And then there's conflict within the family as to who should get what and whether or not they think that grandma's will um, is real, that such and such may have, um, you know, um, forced her to do it or put it in writing and to name them. So all of that can happen. And so six months can become 12 and 12 months can become 18. And I could go on and on because there still is um, an estate that is has been in conflict for, for more than 20 years. And so what does that mean? That means there has been no distributions made. Now, of course, that's not the norm, but I can tell you that it is more likely than not that your estate will not be settled within um, a quick six to eight months. And so that causes great delay for family members who need access to your assets. So avoiding probate is awesome. A trust is private. It's unchallengeable. It can be immediately implemented, meaning as soon as you pass, you just start pulling the, the binder out and you pull that particular document that will give you access to all of the assets. You contact the um, account holders and you start galvanizing, start pulling all of the assets together. And then you, once you have a good inventory, you can start your distribution. So um, it's, it's great. It just is, it just makes great sense. But it's also flexible and you have great creativity on what you would say and how you would, um, you know, put parameters around the distributions. For instance, if you have an adult child that you think is, um, you know, doesn't handle finances well, you can say, well, I don't want him or her to get a full outright distribution. They will just squander it you can create a trust that continues and pays him or her out over time. It could either be every year, every month. It could be when he or she finishes college, gets married, has a baby, buys the first house. It can be on other anniversaries. So you name it and you can put it in practice. I tell people, as long as it's not illegal, it can be done. Um, you could even say, I've had clients who says, oh, you know, my son is very successful, but he has, you know, a drug or a drinking problem. We have put in, um, you know, requirements to be drug tested or, you know, to be clean or whatever the case may be. Every family has uniqueness that can be addressed. It also provides for tax minimization strategies. So if you have a large estate that could be considered a taxable estate, then we can put parameters or creative solutions around it that are all legal that will allow you to minimize your tax liability. Now, for those of us who are getting up in age and you heard me say us, I'm included, um, we can start planning for our long-term care. And when you do that, there are different types of trusts 
that you can create, um, some that are irrevocable, which will allow you, if you need, to um, apply for government subsidies, whether it's Medicaid, not Medicare, Medicaid, that will help to pay for nursing home stay. There is nothing that you have unless you have a long-term insurance plan, a long-term plan that covers some or all of your um, insurance, your nursing home stay. There's no insurance or medical plan that pays, medical plan that pays for long-term care. So using um, strategies that will allow your resources to not be counted towards your, um, your long-term care applications would be very, very beneficial. But in a trust, you also can account for guardianship nominations, identifying who do you want to take care of your children? Who do you want to take care of your vulnerable loved one with um, a special needs? And you can exclude some people. And that's really important because there are some people that I don't want them to even look at my children, much less care for them. But the biggest part about having a trust is that the trust has to own something. So after you create the trust, you then call, you do something called funding. And all that is, is changing your deed into the name of the trust. So instead of it being Paulette and Troy Lundy, it will be the Paulette the, or the Lundy, the Lundy Trust. And very simple. So now your trust owns your assets and that is what gives your trustee, your successor trustee who will act on your behalf, the authority to access the assets in your trust. So having a trust is great, but making sure that you've titled and funded your trust is the, the biggest part that has to happen as well. Great, thank you so much for that. Yeah, a, a lot of moving parts there, um, but clearly the value of a trust, uh, especially when it comes to avoiding the uh, what can be a painful uh, probate process. Um, yes. Just hugely important, and yes. you know, it, it seems like every every industry and business is moving slow enough right now, and that includes the courts. So, you know, anything that's 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 happening in the next um, uh, six to twelve months seems like a seems like a wish when it comes absolutely. to absolutely, absolutely. So, Paula, we've got about five minutes left, and I uh -huh. think it's really important to jump into uh, power of attorney and healthcare directives because that yes. applies to situations where you know, the, the, the loved one or ourselves is still alive. Yes. Um, but we've, we've granted power to another individual to, to make some decisions on our behalf. Yes, it is extremely important that everyone over 18 has a power of attorney and possibly even an advanced, an advanced healthcare directive. And it gives someone else the authority to handle your affairs, whether it's medical or financial. It can be effective immediately or upon incapacitation. Um, it can be revoked at any time and it does expire at your death, which is why having an, ex an extended plan is beneficial. But it is of paramount importance that you have a power of attorney for your financial as well as your medical affairs so that people can jump in. God forbid, you know, COVID starts to or some other thing heats up again. If you were to become incapacitated today, that there is something in place for you so someone can help you. Yeah, and I'll chime in there. Um, I can speak from personal experience. Uh, I, I'm one of six siblings, and uh, my father suffered a severe stroke uh, on New Year's Day of 2007 and went on to live for another 13 years. Mm. And, you know, the fact that he had a power of attorney in place yeah. to help my mom make decisions, that she had people she could lean on, not only did it help her get through a, a long period of grieving, but she did not have the, let's say, financial wherewithal or knowledge to make certain decisions. And to, so to have that support um, can really help a family. And oftentimes, Absolutely. oftentimes, you know, in a way, save a lot of relationships, especially if you have a big family with, with numerous siblings. Uh, it's just so important. It, it, it is extremely important. And it's unfortunate that we think of it too late. We think of it after something happens. Got a call this morning. Mom had a stroke. She's in the hospital, unresponsive, and they wanted a POA. She cannot give authority. It requires the person, the, the principal, to give the authority to someone else. 
she no longer can give authority. So that will thrust you into a guardianship, a very expensive guardianship um, process that is unnecessary. Advanced Healthcare Directive, as you said, is definitely another document that helps us today. So it again is appointing someone, but to speak on your behalf in a very finite situation, it is um, where you are practically, sadly to say, on your deathbed. And the doctor says that there is nothing that can be done, um, your terminal, your end stage. And so you're now expressing what your wishes are for whether you want life support, nutrition, pain medication, um, dehydration. You can uh, um, you know, achieve so many things there. You can say whether you want to be intubated or not, um, do not resuscitate, do not intubate. Um, it avoids family conflict because who wants to make that decision whether it's um, the right thing to, as they say, pull the plug or not. It's a very hard decision because we really don't know. But if we know that you or your family member, your loved one does not want to be on a respirator, not even for one day, then we should honor those decisions and so therefore, it's important that you choose wisely. You choose the, the person who is going to honor your decisions and make sure that it comes to pass. So having an advanced health care directive and a power of attorney is extremely important today. Yep. So, so let's wrap up here, Paulette. There's been so much that we've covered in the last 31 minutes that uh, I want to put a bow on this and sort of... Well, Walk away with what what are those those key highlights, those key talking points that we can be thinking about um, as we begin to tackle our own estate planning? Sure. It helps to communicate your desires. It keeps the family out of court and out of conflict. It really ensures that your assets go to the right person because if you don't have a plan, the 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 law has a plan for you. It's called the laws of intestacy, and they will give it to you know the next of kin. There's this whole family tree, and so it may go to someone that you're estranged from, a brother, a sister, a parent that you haven't spoken to um, for many many years, and or a cousin. So it's important that you decide. And so ensuring that you identify the right people who you want your assets to be transferred to is important. And then it minimizes time, money, and, and I can't, you know, I can't express that enough. Time, money, conflict, um, privacy is really important. So getting started now is an easy thing to do, Dave. Do an inventory of what you have. What do you have? And as you start documenting it, you'll find out that you have more than you thought. Create a plan. What is it that I want? Do I want a will? Do I want to trust? Um, you know, do I care that it would be in a public um, arena if I do a will? If not, fine. If that works for you, you know, it's really about what works for you and your family. So create a plan of action, then put that plan into action. Talk to an expert. Speak to your financial advisor. Speak to your attorney. Speak to your accountant. And then once you have that plan that's fully in action, fully signed, fully effective, fully funded, if you do a trust, then make sure that you don't just put it on the shelf and let it collect dust. Update it regularly. Make sure that if there are life changes, marriage, baby, death, or um, you know, separation, whatever it is, that you update your plan. Many people have inherited um, money from ex-loved ones. <laughs> and so I'm sure that was not the intended for everyone, but update your plan regularly. But bottom line, Today is the time. That alarm that was sounded in the beginning is still sounding right now. I hope you hear it in your ears. The time is now. Yeah, thank you so much, Paulette. Um, for those on the line, um, yeah, I hope you took something away from today's conversation. I'm going to stick around here for a little bit if you have any questions to throw in the chat box. Be sure to grab the handouts that are included in the drop down menu, especially if. if if your company works on the principal platform for your 401k, principal offers a free will prep service. So if that's something you've yet to do, be sure to, to take advantage of that. And then of course, you know, if you think your situation is a bit more complex or you want some handholding or want someone to talk to, uh, you can certainly get in touch with Paulette. We can help you get in touch with her. Uh, you have our information. Paulette's information is here on the screen. Um, and outside of that, I uh, want to wish everyone the happiest of holidays. And uh, Paulette, thank you so much. You're welcome. Happy holidays, everyone. And um, Dave, if you want, I can stick around as well. If there are any questions, we can surely tackle them together.
Okay, great. Well, we're going to hang here for a few moments, and, and outside of that, everyone have a, a great rest of your day. Awesome. It looks like if we, we do still have anyone on the line, um, it looks like there are a couple questions. Uh, I, I want to try to get this name right. Anuraha, are, are Anuraha. you still there? Are, yes, you, you, can you hear me? Yes, Paulette, are you okay, still there? I am. Okay, so yeah, I was muted. I was trying to like you know figure out how to ask this. So yeah, thank you for the information. And that. this has been on my mind actually, creating a trust. So I was wondering, like, how long does it take to, you know, set one up? Like, if I decide to start the process, how long it takes? And then uh, also interested in how the costs involved in setting up uh, the initial costs as well as the maintenance. Sure. So it, it can be done in a matter of weeks. You know, it, sometimes I tell people that we can move faster than they move in that they need to give us the information so that we can populate and draft the trust. And so, you know, if let's say someone came to us today, we had the consultation and they returned all of the information within a week, we could pretty much, um, barring the holidays or, or even um, uh, weekends, we can have a trust created between two to four weeks, possibly closer to two. Um, once we have all the information, we we start drafting. We understand the urgency of of you know this area, and so we want to do it right away so that we can make sure that it's it's effective. Um, in terms of cost, it really does depend on your situation and the design of your trust. And I will be more than happy to discuss it with you further um, to give you something that is more more impart you know more along the lines of where you are. But in general, uh, um, if I if I were to do a survey of myself and my colleagues, trust you know can be somewhere around the mark of about forty-five to five thousand dollars, and and possibly slightly up depending on how you draft your trust. And there are many things that you you know need to consider that will either keep the cost lower or make it higher. Okay. Okay. So since um, since we are going through our company, so are the, is there any uh, like a discounted price on the uh, you know on the cost of setting it up? Um, I actually can provide a a um, a coupon which will make your your initial meeting free. I, I can do that and I can give that to Chris and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to. So I'm just gonna say, okay. I'll give it to Chris or Dave and they will determine how to distribute that. But we can give a coupon that would um, value at $750 and we sometimes give an additional coupon for 250 that will help to take off um, the, you know, to deal with the initial consultation as well as take off um, a couple of extra dollars on your plan. So I will okay. be more than happy to share that with with him and with you guys. Um, it's it's my pleasure to do so. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. You're yeah, welcome. Thank you, Paulette. Paulette, we've got another question here from uh, Herman or or German. I'm sorry if I if I pronounce that incorrectly. 
Um, what companies or what are the mo most economical ways do we have to create trust wills, POAs, uh, health directives? Um, is that a one-stop shop type thing or should we be looking to spread our chips around? Sure. So um, there are many attorneys who are estate planning attorneys who can assist you in creating a trust or will package. And when I say package, I mean that if we were to do a trust for you and most attorneys, if they do, if they're worth their salt, they should give you an effective plan. So if you do a will package, it should include the other documents that will help to address your today. Um, as well as your death. If we do a trust package, we will include additional documents um, so that you have you have um, you know your power of attorney, you have your advanced health care directive. So I, I will never tell, and I, and I say this lightly because I understand that the principal has a platform, but I'm an attorney and I study the law. So I will never tell someone to go online to do something that is legal in nature without having someone to talk to. Some people have enough information and they can do it. And maybe principal is a great platform and they will be able to do it um, with what principal has established. So I will tell you, if you wanna try online, try principal. If you wanna speak with someone and you have unique or you have questions or unique issues that you would like to be addressed, speak with someone so that when you do it, it's done correctly and you don't have to revisit it or your family doesn't have to pay the price for it. So um, it's always best to do a one kind of stop shop, meaning if the attorney and or platform is going to do anything for you to make sure that it is done um, completely. Okay. Great, yeah. And, and, and Bill, <laughs> I see that you're on the line. Do you have a question or are you just hanging out for the for the chat? Let me see if I can unmute mute you if you do have a question. Uh yes, thank you for asking. No, I'm I'm just listening. I I uh for those of us who couldn't attend from the beginning, will some sort of handouts be available encapsulating yeah. some of the subject matter today? Yeah, yeah. So if you if you look down in the handout section um in the sort of chat box, there's there's two pieces of collateral there, um, the presentation being one of them. And then um we're actually gonna have a recording of this conversation and we'll we'll share it. Um with the with the various representatives from the, the companies very and good we'll, thank you. we'll make we'll make sure that gets to you to answer your question good thank you sure thing um paulette um uh herman would love to set up a consultation with you should i he's he's got um your information here on the screen um, so I think that's probably, and I'll, I'll unmute him. <laughs> it's probably the, the best thing to do here. Mm -hmm. And um, so can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Herman, please yep. give our office a call at 410-405-7996 and let them get you on my calendar and let them know that you are part of the um, the presentation today with macro view and we will ensure that we get you on right away and that we implement the the coupons that um the it's really a gift certificate that we um, will give you so that your initial session will be free and um we can get started with you not a problem awesome sounds good thank you so much you're so welcome all right well paulette again thank you so much i, I think that uh that covers all of it and um uh we'll hopefully be talking with you soon sounds good thank you so much dave thank you everyone it was a pleasure presenting and i look forward to helping helping anyone if you want to call thank you have a great day bye you too bye-bye